Uh, it's good to have the opportunity to have this lecture here at the university, which is uh, in memory of uh, our uh, highly esteemed graduate and former colleague, uh, Faye Gale, uh, acknowledging the tremendous contribution that she made and the ongoing legacy uh, that she has left as an outstanding academic and as a passionate advocate for equal opportunities. And I'm really delighted that the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia has established this ongoing memorial to Faye, and uh, we're very proud that the University of Adelaide, together with the Academy, is able to host a lecture in this inaugural series. Uh, I should say that we're also pleased to announce that the University of Adelaide is going to honour Faye Gale's legacy by naming our new Centre for Research on Gender as the uh, Faye Gale Centre for Research on Gender, and uh, we're thrilled to be able to do that. Now I'll leave further details of Faye's contribution to Professor Nick Harvey, uh, but I would like to say how glad uh, we are that uh, Faye accepted the opportunity to come back here to Adelaide uh, upon her uh, retirement, although I can't imagine Faye ever actually retired, uh, when Mary O'Kane, who was Vice-Chancellor at the time, uh, invited her to come and work here at that point. And it was a great pleasure for me when I arrived here to have Faye working close to uh, the Vice-Chancellor's office uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, strangely enough, I've known Faye for quite a long time, basically since I first became a Vice-Chancellor, which is now a very long time, over 15 years ago when I was in New Zealand at that time, and I met Faye, and Faye became uh, uh, a good friend, and I, I really have uh, appreciated greatly over the years benefiting from Faye's wisdom and her counsel, and uh, know that she would have, uh, that, that that would have been heartily endorsed by both my predecessors here at Adelaide uh, in the form of Mary O'Kane and Cliff Blake. So it's a great pleasure for me uh, to, to be here this evening. Uh, can I now hand over to uh, Professor Nick Harvey, who's the Executive Dean uh, of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and uh, a long-time uh, uh, close colleague of Faye. So thank you again for coming. Nick. Okay. Thanks, uh, <coughs> Vice-Chancellor. Um, my job is to give a bit of background on Faye's uh, role at Adelaide over 25 years, which was a third of her life. Uh, that's, she was working here for a third of her life, but then if you add on her study, it's even longer. Um, so I'll only be five or ten minutes, because the main job is uh, over to Professor Kay Anderson. Now, I first met uh, Faye 31 years ago when I came down to take a job as a lecturer in geography, and that's also when I met, although you wouldn't think so, looking at the youthful nature. <laughs> uh, first of all, Gwendolyn Fay Gale, Gil Gilding at the time, born in country South Australia, and it's important to realise the context for her background. She was brought up, her father was a Methodist minister, and it's important to realise that she was um, exposed to Aborigines from mission stations who came in. She went to school at the Methodist Ladies College in Adelaide. She studied Adelaide, um, she studied geography at Adelaide and then did honours in 1953. She taught at Walford School and then she got married in uh, 1957 and two of her bridesmaids, Gladys Long and Linda Vale, were from the Aboriginal Mission Station. They were foster sisters, so that's an important uh, influence. Uh, she then returned as Faye, Faye Gale, to Adelaide where she began her academic career as a geographer and there's a photo of her with her foster sisters, Linda and Gladys, different fashions in those days. Uh, and I must thank uh, her daughter, uh, Faye's daughter Marie, for giving me a few photos. Um, now, I just want to place her in context with what's happened with the development of geography at the University of Adelaide. I've put a few pictures there of key geographers, but I won't talk about all of them because I don't have much time. Um, just note here, this guy at the top left is John Clucas, who was appointed here in 1900. He was the first librarian and he started teaching geography in 1904. Charles Fenner was appointed uh, about 1930. Uh, but I want to talk more about these people at the bottom who had an influence on Faye's career. Um, first of all, this is a photo photograph from the news uh, in 1949 when Griffith Taylor came to Adelaide. Um, on the left here you have Clary Martin. Now he was um, appointed in 1931 and he was important because he kept geography going through the war years. 
Uh, and also he taught to Faye in the early 50s. But a key person who had a major influence on Faye was uh, Anne Marshall. Now Anne, she was appointed in 1940 and she was a strong advocate of human geography and Kay Anderson will pick up on this theme later. But I just put in there the fact that um, she was a very uh, important uh, mentor for uh, Faye and the fact that she was here giving lectures and at the same time trying to juggle family life. I just put in there the fact that she sort of came in, she needed petrol rations to get in here, she needed a babysitter when she came in to give her lectures and uh, she was bringing up her family. Um, so she was a very important role model and a teacher and mentor and the other thing to note is that um, she later introduced Faye to Griffith Taylor who's considered to be the sort of founder of academic geography in Australia. Um, then we have Professor Graham Lawton. Now he was the first professor. He was appointed in 51 as a reader but um, later became a professor in 59. Now he introduced honours geography and Faye did her, she was the first honours student so she did her thesis on the German settlement up at Handorf. So he was very significant um, and he was also significant in getting geography going. So Faye was the first geography honours student uh, at Adelaide. That was 1953. Here's a photo of her graduating with her BA degree. I'm not sure who her friends were at the time. Um, and I just wanted to give you this little quote from Faye. Um, when she was an honours student in 52, she went across to Sydney to the ANZAS conference. The ANZAS is no longer, but um, Anne Marshall introduced her to Griffith Taylor and went, she went along to a geography reception. And this is what she said. She said, the highlight of that reception was my first meeting with Griffith Taylor. The occasion was so memorable. I think it was that experience that determined me to become a professional geographer. So really affected her. Here she is working on her honours thesis at Adelaide. Another person who had a major influence on her was Archie Grenfell Price. Um, you'll notice here that um, he was nearly 40 years on university council here. He actually was significant uh, in, the, in sort of keeping geography going because he opposed the vice chancellor who wanted to close geography down. Obviously a less enlightened vice chancellor than uh, we have here today. Um, and the vice chancellor finally backed down and appointed uh, Charles Fenner. And then later on, uh, Archie himself was appointed as a part-time lecturer. But the key influence on uh, Faye was his strong sense of social justice and also the fact that he was a mentor and became her PhD supervisor in uh, 1957. So Faye in the 1960s, um, she completed her PhD. The thesis title was um, a study of assimilation part Aborigines in South Australia. So that's really what we call now the uh, stolen generation. And she also became the first PhD at Adelaide. In 1964, she was appointed as a lecturer. And she, like her teacher and mentor, Anne Marshall, also had to juggle uh, raising a family along with her academic career. So she was an inspiring lecturer in cultural geography, which Kay will be talking about later, and a role model for students and sort of imbued this strong sense of social justice. And here's a photo of her when she got a PhD celebrating in New Zealand at the time with her daughter. This is just um, to show you the flavour of um, when Faye was here in the 60s, the type of technology with the field work, with the field sketching, plane tables surveying, uh, nowadays you probably use handheld GIS and Google. And here's a photograph of Faye in the field with a group of students. Um, Faye was an academic um, uh, and pioneer for social justice. A, a key um, book was Urban Aborigines, which Kay will be talking about. So it's important that just to realise the um, her research was focused on Aboriginal people and the sort of stolen generation as we call it today. She was a gifted teacher in cultural geography. 
She conducted research into the disempowerment of Aboriginal woman, women. She was very influential in moves towards citizenship, Indigenous land rights, um, and she was an advocate for women and women's rights. Here's uh, another couple of photos of her on field work. Uh, another one in the mid-70s, and I'd just like to point out that out of all the legacy, don't, we mustn't forget the legacy of some of her students. I mean, I know some of these, um, he's over in the, um, in the UK, um, Rob Allen, uh, Joy Wondersitz works here. And here we have uh, Jane Jacobs, who's a professor of cultural geography at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and Faye at Adelaide, was amazing, really. She was she was first she, she was the first woman to be appointed to a chairman of a department in the university. She was then promoted to professor, so she was the first professor, first woman professor at University of Adelaide. Then she was appointed pro vice chancellor, again the first woman to to do that. And in '89, she was awarded an AO for service to social science, particularly geography and Aboriginal studies. Now, after 89, she then went to University of West Australia, where she was vice-chancellor, I think, for two terms, and that was a real high point of her career. And then uh, she retired and came back here to work. And she didn't really retire. She was always working uh, tirelessly. So here's a few more of her achievements. She was president of the Institute of Australian Geographers, uh, first woman president of the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee, uh, she, she came back here to an honorary position. She was, also, she was president of the Academy of Social Sciences. In 2001, she got the Griffith Taylor Medal, and this is the most prestigious medal in geography. Um, she took on many positions, and she left a legacy of the advocacy for social justice and equity, respect for land and its people, uh, learning, and a lasting impact, and particularly on her students. And I thought it was appropriate to finish with this photo here, as, the, as we have here our speaker and the joint uh, publication. And that is a very important part of a legacy. So thank you. It gives me very great pleasure and uh, some honor to introduce Professor Kay Anderson, who's going to deliver the inaugural Fagale Memorial Travelling le Lecture, which uh, I think is a, a marvellous uh, initiative of the Academy of Social Sciences in, in Australia. I can't think of anyone who is more appropriate or more worthy of delivering this inaugural lecture uh, than Professor Kay Anderson. Uh, she's had an absolutely outstanding career, um, and not only uh, has she been significantly influenced in that career uh, by Fagale, um, I, I think many aspects of her career actually parallel those of, of, of Fay. I was really privileged to follow, first of all, Professor Graham Lawton and then Fay Gale uh, as the third uh, Professor of Geography here at the University of Adelaide. This department's been operating continuously for more than 100 years, which makes it one of uh, the oldest departments, not just in Australia, but, but, but in the world. In the, at that period of time, uh, we've had many uh, distinguished graduates, but I certainly rank Professor Gale and Professor Anderson uh, right up there as two uh, women who've made absolutely seminal contributions to geography. But I, I think equally important is that both of them have displayed a humanism and commitment to social justice and equity, which has influenced not just their academic work, but uh, their wider involvement in and, and uh, uh, influence upon wider society, particularly here in Australia. Professor Anderson graduated from the University of Adelaide with a Bachelor of Arts Honours in, in 1979, and she subsequently completed her PhD at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in Canada. A few years ago, I uh, ran into her supervisor, uh, Professor David uh, Lay, who's a very good friend of mine. And I was surprised at the time because he was interrogating me in great detail about our latest crop of uh, uh, honour students and high quality uh, um, uh, undergraduates. And I thought this was an um, altruistic uh, interest in the, uh, the health of geography in Australia. But it very quickly became aware that he had such a fantastic experience in supervising uh, Professor Anderson's PhD that he was looking for more. And, uh, 
I quickly realised that uh, his interest uh, uh, was other than an altruistic one. Uh, but he, uh, he, I remember him saying to me that it, it, supervising Kay was the absolutely outstanding experience for him. Uh, she was just an absolutely uh, model uh, PhD student. Professor Anderson um, has had a, a, a number of positions. Like any good geographer, she's been very mobile. Um, she's held positions on uh, three continents and uh, uh, she's had a number of fellowships at Oxford and Cambridge University, very sought after fellowships. She was Professor of Cultural Geography at uh, uh, Durham University in the United Kingdom and, uh, and also was at Queen's University in Canada. Uh, it was wonderful uh, to see her come back to the University of Western Sydney and take on uh, a role um, as a, pro a Professor of Cultural Research in this really important university which is so linked in with its, uh, uh, with its local community. Professor Anderson has been awarded a number of, uh, of honours in recognition of her ex ex outstanding uh, contribution, particularly uh, in the area of cultural geography and uh, racial historiography. In 2007, she was elected a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, uh, but 10 years earlier, she was awarded the Medal of the Academy of Social Sciences, so she has a, a, a distinguished connection uh, with, our, with our Academy. Uh, she's also uh, a Fellow of the Equivalent Academy in the United Kingdom, and she's been awarded honours by both the Institute of Australian Geographers uh, and the Association of American Geographers. She's one of the world leaders in what uh, has been a real flowering of cultural geography uh, over the last couple of decades. And I know personally, in talking to Faye, that she took great joy uh, in this uh, uh, immense development uh, within her subject. And Faye was a very important uh, part of that. And Kay has continued on that tradition uh, very well. She's not only published a large number of uh, very influential and important articles, but she has some uh, books, one of which I would regard uh, as a classic, which has gone to uh, five editions. Her, her uh, study of Vancouver's Chinatown, uh, Racial Discourse in Canada, uh, 1875 uh, to 1980. Her latest uh, book, uh, Race and the Crisis of Humanism, uh, won the 2008 New South Wales Premier's uh, Literary Award for Critical Writing. Professor Fay Gale was an absolutely exceptional academic and an exceptional person. She left an enormous legacy uh, on Australia as well as on the subject of geography and she left an enormous legacy for people like me who, uh, who benefited very greatly uh, in a number of ways uh, throughout her career. Um, I believe that uh, uh, Kay uh, very much continues the spirit of, of Faye Gale and uh, I look forward very much to, to Kay's uh, address tonight which is entitled A Propagation from the Periphery, Rethinking the Human in Memory of Faye Gale. Thank you very much. One toils away earnestly, some days ineffectually, in front of the uh, computer screen, other days immersed in a creative rush, and three decades later, it's possible to talk of a life's work. <coughs> For me, the curiosity to get to grips with the rise and the resilience of that discourse of human differentiation called race became during the course of a journey across a number of social science disciplines, something of an intellectual passion. This intrigue has to do not only with the unfortunate material impact of the race concept, meted out as it is in rampantly diverse forms of racism to those reckoned to be on its wrong side. But also because for the longest time I have found the concept of race most peculiar. How? Why is it? In the face, as it were, of such vastly differentiated gradients of phenotypical, cultural, physical variation as has long existed the world over, did such a deterministic conception of difference come about? <clears throat> what made possible the intelligibility of the idea that the rich diversity of the world's people could actually be fitted into racial categories? And why the endurance, 
despite, yes, the Obama factor that inclines a number of commentators these days to speak of post-racial times. Tell that, I say, to a detained Aboriginal at the uh, um, Adelaide Raman Centre. Why race's persistence? Why its resilience? When the idea of a divided human family was supposed to have been laid to rest by Darwin some 150 years ago. And if not then, by that claim for a shared human inheritance, then the claims of population geneticists some 60 years ago, or more recently, the Human Genome Project. <coughs> the, the usual answers given of some impulsive people, whether it be anxious or assertive, to ethnocentrism and prejudice, or in more critical accounts, of some ideological will to power and identity of certain people over others, lines of argument that have of course been very variously disseminated across generations of, of social scientists. These usual answers have to my mind been variously adequate but not sufficient as I'll come to later. That's when I'll turn in the lecture today uh, to relay a little bit about my efforts to dig into and to chip away at some rather fundamental Western premises through which it's been my intuition, a concept of innate human difference, got its very footing at a particular historical juncture. And while decades now of post-colonial critique of Western ideas of progress, civilization, modernity, developmentalism, have certainly helped unsettle the ground in which that concept of fundamental human difference became buried, ever latently, I should say, there's more work to be done, I want to suggest tonight, new conversations to convene to push on race's theorisation. Hard ontological work is at stake, it turns out. And yet my hunch, or at least my hope, is that the effort is worthwhile more generally. At a time when scholars in many fields, and not just in race historiography, are trying to overcome blockages in the way of some deeply integrative thinking that is needed to confront the complex challenges of the 21st century, including, that is, our understanding of our past. The move that interests me most in this regard right now, as a, and as a geographer by training, is one that engages a sharply defining knowledge demarcation. Most classically, this is the divide between the domains of, on the one hand, human affairs, that is, human sociological affairs in which the subject of race, like class and gender, has long been positioned, and on the other hand, environmental affairs, in which the human characters are typically figured as entering a stage they impact from outside, as variously masters, managers, observers, guardians or saviours. Most generally then, my lecture uh, this evening dwells at the interface of the knowledge domains of society and nature, where my narrative interest will be in communicating an account, not only for what it might have to offer a potential re-theorisation of race, it also aims to provoke a more open disposition to the very possibility of reparation across those split domains of knowledge, that is, of society versus environment, of culture versus nature. But more of that, um, like I said, a bit later. Interfaces, scratching at the door of seemingly settled truths, writing from the margins. I conjure up Faye Gale here, who for me was the person who fanned those sparks of restless curiosity and conviction at a formative educational stage. Faye was born a geographer. As a young, I'm told, dyslexic girl, she enjoyed reading maps more so than words and was always interested in the evidence of the world around her, the immediate qualities of places and landscapes, the raw material of knowing and of being there. She was a formidable walker, as I was to find out when um, she uh, skived off for a couple of days as VC um, at UWA. I hope you're able to do this. Um, she skived off for a couple of days um, from the University of Western Australia when she was a BC to take us 
um, to visit an Aboriginal mission, or I should say a former Aboriginal mission that was run by a couple of Benedictine monks. A trip that also took us uh, far inland from Perth to the well-known uh, wildflowers. And at the time I was a, uh, an associate professor of geography and managed to read a road map incorrectly and ended up getting us completely, totally lost, which of course Faye never, and she was very intolerant of bulls. Um, she never let me forget this. And in part though, in my defence I should say, because Faye kept talking just so incessantly and she was so ardent about um, the, the physical and the uh, cultural features, the singular cultural and the singular physical features of the landscape before our eyes. The week-long field trips that Faye ran as a um, teacher at Adelaide University were for transformative experiences for her undergraduate and her honours students. I was one of those students and speak today in honour of this person who left footprints on my life and as I expect to convey this, mo uh, this morning, this evening, um, on my work. I'd like to thank the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and its representative here, uh, Professor Keith Hancock, as we've heard, a former president of the Academy. I'd like to thank the Academy then for the initiative of this lecture series. I'd like to thank the Vice-Chancellor of the University of um, Adelaide, Professor James McGuire, uh, for hosting this event. I thank him dearly for that. I'd like to thank Professor Nick Harvey uh, for his reflections that we've heard on Faye. And I'd like to thank Professor Graham Hugo for um, his uh, characteristically fluent and, and warm and very thoughtful uh, words of introduction and to you all here this evening for coming along. They say that what matters most about our tombstones um, is not so much the two dates marking um, our beginning and our end, but instead, I don't have one of those Beamer things, but instead um, the little dash, as it were, in between those two dates, that this is what matters most about our tombstones. In the case of Faye Gale, there's a great deal that was compressed um, into that mere line. There's so many contributions condensed into that line across so many fields and sectors, um, as we've already um, heard this evening. Faye's intellectual influence is my concern here this evening, and it's fitting that there be a series um, in memory um, of her, because although none of us, I think, despite the ARC, et cetera, um, what they might think, um, despite the fact that none of us, I think, really ever know and can measure the impact of our work and told, as I've just intimated, that we increasingly are to prove it. Um, Faye was um, fortunate enough, I think, to live long enough to, to actually witness the demonstrable impact that she had on the trajectories of many of her graduate students and her undergraduate students that she supervised here at Adelaide University. So I'm going to spend a few minutes then, um, we've heard a bit about Faye, but I'm going to spend a few more minutes uh, to try to capture uh, something of the moral compass that Faye set her students at what is after all an in inaugural lecture in her honour. <coughs> it was palpably obvious to a cohort of we students from the whiter than white suburbs of Adelaide in the 1970s that Faye, the teacher, was promoting a new sort of geography here at this university, one that stood at an angle to the prevailing scientific and quantitative modes of inquiry of the time. Her courses were a self-styled synthesis of strands of human and physical geography, a geography that sat at the interface of culture and environment, a geography that in the Australian context had for Faye to acknowledge um, the continent's distinctive environmental features, but also had to acknowledge the landscape imprints of the cultural orientations or the different ways of seeing the world of the various inhabitants um, of, this, of this country. Now this was neither fashionable nor respectable geography at the time. There was resistance from the geomorphologists and climatologists in the physical geography camp and there was resistance from the quantitatively driven spatial scientists in the human geography camp. Of this opposition and her, uh, and her determination in the face of it, um, and as the only female professor, as we've heard, for many years at Adelaide, of this I was to find out more much later on. 
But as a geographer in formation, and as we've heard, there were other students that I should like to mention this evening. Uh, in particular, uh, my friend and colleague Jane Jacobs, uh, Richard Baker, uh, Joy Wondersitz. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that we were all captivated by her very creative thinking with interfaces. Her work dwelt at the intersection of, as I've said, the physical and human worlds, the real and the humanly perceived worlds. In an essay for the Australasian Society for Human Biology that she wrote some 20 years ago, she urged for more dialogue between, uh, as she called it, culture and science. In her example, she sought for more dialogue between indigenous knowledge about caves on the Nullarbor Plain and the uh, thinking, the work of caste uh, geomorphologists um, as just one science, she noted, that increasingly had to adapt itself to the ever-shifting evidence about the time scale for the human occupation of this continent. There were other awkward intersections too on which Fay's geographic imagination lit, not least the often opposed realms of city and Aborigine. Fay's book in 1972 titled um, Urban Aborigines, um, a cover uh, inside cover of it here, notice assisted by um, Alison uh, Bookman. I don't know if she's here tonight, she, she was invited. Um, this uh, work grew out of um, Faye's honours and her PhD research, as we've heard, on so-called part Aborigines. This was an original exposition of people she met while travelling by ute around remote South Australia in the 1950s and 1960s people who had migrated to towns after generations of restricted lives um, on, on reserves. Now these were people who did not fit the mould um, of supposedly real Aborigines, by which was popularly meant at the time traditional people, the desert people who had caught so much attention from Austra Australian anthropologists after uh, Durkheim's famous writings in the 1910s on the elementary forms of religious life. There were, however, um, encouraging anthropologists, especially uh, William Stanner at ANU, who was struck by Faye's immediate interest in people like her own foster sister, um, Edna Usting, who is here this evening, um, one of the, the three foster sisters of Faye. We've heard about two already this evening. Um, she had an immediate interest in people like Edna, who lived with Faye and her Methodist missionary parents in suburban Adelaide. People then who were not of a time back then, nor from a place out there in the back of beyond. People then who were neither so-called black or white and instead living on the fringes of both those groups and who Faye could see were so excluded precisely because they were doubly invisible. Mm. An image then from, taken from that book, Urban Aborigines. Ever the one as Faye was to teach from the heart, using as much as she did the tools of evocation and empathy to connect her students to other people's lives, to other times, to other policy moods. As much as she used these tools of evocation and empathy, um, as much as the more respected pedagogic tools of erudition and expertise, Faye instructed we students in cultures geography not only with lectures on theory, um, for example, Carl, Carl Sauer's theories of culture's evolution that he was disseminating from the Berkeley School of Cultural Geography. So she would certainly do theory, uh, but she would also invoke accounts of people and place, however mundane they might have seemed. And often she would use the art of juxtaposition, such as one account I recall about an Aboriginal boy from Arnhem Land who stayed at her family's house when she was a teenager and how struck she was by this young boy watching his difficulty, barefoot, refusing shoes, trying to negotiate the concrete pavements of her um, urban or city neighbourhood. <coughs> the pragmatist that she was, Faye would never do theory for its own sake, and in any event, she was never content to see Australia through the eyes of the global north. She preferred, in her defiantly particularistic way, to think with the landscape that, as she said, grew her up. So again, by way of a final example here, she would teach us about spatial segregation between groups of people, not only with the abstraction of the map, 
replete with overlays, if you like, of correlations between census variables. She would certainly do that in a, in a kind of uh, no-nonsense uh, way. But she would also then just shift register to accounts of the disjunctures in the biography of the likes of her own foster sister's life, who had been caught up as a stolen child in Australia's earliest genetic, en genetic engineering project. So then, the phenomenon of spatial segregation was dramatised for we students, though never in the manner of a crusade, and she was always very careful about using a pseudonym. It was, segregation was taught to us as a, a, a sequence, a, a, a biography of spatialised journeys. In this case, from Edna's a Northern Territory campsite, where she lived until she was nine years old, to a compound in Darwin, followed by a missionary uh, dormitory on uh, Croker Island until the late 1950s. Then dispersal south, come the policy shift to assimilation in the 1960s, and her circulation through the missionary networks to which Faye's parents belonged. And from there to life in white suburban Adelaide, where she grew up with Faye, and an image here of them uh, much later uh, in life. And continuing then on the spatialised journey here of, of, of Edna, Edna's eventual reunion with, if not ever, her parents, at least a brother she had not seen in some 40 or 50 years. <coughs> Faye's themes then cut across a whole range of social science disciplines, geography, of course, but also anthropology, history, to some extent politics among them. Her intersectional uh, sectional thinking and her vividly situated imagination was what I, for one student, carried away with me. Of course, there were also discomforts and disconnects, if you like, as I set off, not as a conveyor belt um, out of one of Faye's classes. It could have been this very lecture theatre. In fact, it probably was. Um, there were some discomforts and disconnects uh, as I set off on my own path. And unease, in particular, with the kind of minority studies cultural geography about Group X in Place Y uh, that I'd grown up with at Adelaide. It was a very vaguely felt disposition at the time um, against what seemed to be this wireistic premise of otherness in studies like my very own honours thesis for which I interviewed Vietnamese refugees in this city. And it kind of set me wondering what on earth would I say if someone came to my door asking, how long have you lived here? Have you found work? What have been your experiences so far of living in Adelaide? Well, actually, they were quite a lot better than Murray Bridge. But anyway, you, you get the point. How long are you expecting to stay here? And so on. This very vague discomfort turned into sustained argumentation some years later when, with a Commonwealth scholarship that Faye suggested, and I need to correct that, actually insisted that I apply for, and under the influence of a philosophical turn to post-structuralism that was embraced in the Department of Geography at the University of British Columbia in Canada in the 1980s, I produced a conceptualisation of Vancouver's Chinatown as an enclave that reflects more about the West than the East. The West cultures of race and racism, its changing Orientalist stereotypes and the ways in which um, they circulated and had material impact, impacts right through all levels of the Canadian state, um, which was, after all, a state that very much prided, its, prided itself on a progressive multicultural record vis-à-vis -vis the nation to its south. <coughs> this work of critique in the classic vein of identity politics, demonstrating that neither the racialization of people's identity was fixed at birth, nor the racialization of places like Chinatowns cast in stone, and that instead, both were mutually constitutive dynamics within the power differentiated cartographies of colonialism and global migration. This work of critique then took me a very long way from the whiter than whiter suburbs of Adelaide. And from which it seems in hindsight, I continue to journey. <coughs> Some 10 years ago, I became convinced I could get only so far in answering the question that I posed earlier regarding the sources and resilience of that um, classific classificatory grid of human differentiation called race 
If I stayed within the frame of identity politics that I just tried to encapsulate, it would take too long to detail the limitations of that framework for my immediate purposes here. Suffice to state, and too swiftly, that the assimilation in critical race theory of the many ways of articulating racialized difference and inferiority, for example, Chinese are wily and addicted to vice, Chinese are model citizens, Aborigines live closer to nature, African Americans have lower intelligence, and so on and so forth, and all of the vastly mutated uh, forms of those beliefs. Tracking these only to the defense of white power, profit, and privilege seemed to me to run up against a number of problems, and in particular the problems of functionalism, circularity, and overgeneralization. In short, sourcing racialized power in, white, in a white will to domination and identity seemed to leave that will still inadequately problematized, as I'm going to come back to in a moment. Now, none of these problems um, wholly for a minute discredit the critical turn in race theory, which I continue to find uh, quite useful. Um, and many of us, um, probably a number in this room, continue to work with, uh, refine. Um, I certainly, as I was saying, uh, continue to find it useful in work that I've been doing for far too long uh, in an ongoing project uh, that I started many years ago on Sydney's Redfern. Um, looking at its and trying to piece together its cultural history and transformation. <coughs> However, precisely because the idea of race has furnished some of the most pernicious justifications of exploitation known to us, I've wanted to understand its genealogy more rigorously. And this for me has required a move beyond the terms in which race is usually considered. That is, as stated earlier, beyond the terms that confine it to an interhuman or intersubjective dynamic of identity politics. So in all this, gnawing away, as I have been at the idea of race, while equipping myself with new theoretical tools taken from science and technology studies, an emerging field called the ecological humanities, I've been running with the intuition that understanding race entails a willingness to think across those distinctions of society and environment, of culture and nature, that I flagged up in the opening minutes of this talk. <coughs> the 2007 book, Race and the Crisis of Humanism, began my ongoing effort to think race as a discourse on the human. I'm going to say a tiny um, bit about this, mindful that some of you here um, will have read it, others of you won't be familiar with it at all. Um, and in any case, just in case this is starting to sound like one of those incredibly um, awkward uh, exercises in autoethnography, which I very much hope um, is not the case. Um, uh, what I'm trying to do here is um, put together some background for the core of this lecture that I'm going to come to uh, very soon. <coughs> Substantively, this work uh, tracks the colonial disturbance that was Australia, its people and place, to Enlightenment Christian notions of the human. It elicits the crisis induced in British colonial encounters by a place that bore no apparent trace of what was assumed to be the capacity of all people everywhere to separate from nature. A capacity that was thought to be constrained for some people in some places by environmental factors like soil and climate, but which nonetheless was optimistically assumed to be a potential of all people everywhere, the world over, to cultivate crops, to domesticate animals, and settle collectively into social communities. The book's narrative plot thus centres around the colonial confusion that the Australian state of nature presented to those prevailing ideas of what it was to be human. What were those prevailing ideas of what it meant to be human? They were um, ideas that the human was exceptional in the sense of being above or beyond nature, with nature conceived as two things. Firstly, an external, non-human world of environment out there, and second, an internal animal-like corporeality, a composite animal baseness that people have imagined themselves to transcend and to rise above. 
Yet unlike other hunter-gatherer indigenous people encountered in Africa and the Americas, the Australian appeared to colonists not to have taken distance from nature. A couple of quick images then to kind of uh, capture the perplexity that was the Great South Land for British voyagers and early uh, colonists um, of people, of hunter-gatherers who roamed and camped rather than uh, making permanent settlements, um, of in this case singular animals that uh, defied domestication and that didn't even fit in into uh, European taxonomies, also like the uh, platypus, um, and perplexity too then about a land um, that appeared empty and awaiting improvement. So in the process, um, by the way, um, misrecognising uh, Aboriginal women's yamming practices in pre-contact Australia. And it's to this extent the book argues the Australian Aboriginal provoked upheaval in Christian Enlightenment ideas about the human. In this way, the book tries to make shocking and, and strange all over again the intellectual and effective turn to race determinism that took place in the effort to make sense of the apparent Australian anomaly. A turn to innateism it was that speculated if Aboriginal people don't move out of nature, and despite the very best of efforts to entice them to do so, then perhaps they in inherently can't and won't ever. Theorising the rise of race in this way from Australia, the book goes on to track the increasingly deterministic um, race idea over the 19th century. So I'm going to move on now to the core um, of this lecture now under the title, Thinking with the Head. And I, I'm going to skip over a lot of the methodological points about why the with is underlined there uh, that come out of uh, actor network um, theory and science and technology studies. Lying at the back of that southern story that I, I just um, relayed then uh, of race and the crisis of humanism, and southern I mean in the sense of Raywin Connell's uh, intervention um, in, in the book Southern Theory that I think that Fagay would very much have enjoyed. Um, it's a book that is, um, issues a, a caution against Western knowledge's universalising pretensions. Lying at the back of my own southern story was and continues to be for me a curiosity one that keeps getting re-stimulated in the Australian context of the clash of civilizations that I just described. It's been a curiosity that I've had for I don't know how long about the logic and sources of European-derived ideas of human separateness from nature. And in particular from those sentient beings we gather together under that umbrella category called animals. It's been a curiosity that led me to reading posthumanist philosophies that acknowledge the problem of distinguishing human and animal as indeed a problem. Recognising that while well, yes and of course humans as a species are unique, this is no unique sort of uniqueness in that the differences between our species and non-human species is comparable in genetic terms to those that separate non-human species from each other. So to be clear on the posthumanist claim here, the query is not with the difference of people as a species per se. This is, as I've just said, self-evident and it's non-controversial. Rather, it's to query the sense in which human difference is typically conceived as belonging to a different order. The sense then in which it's usually imagined as a qualitatively distinct kind of difference. So posthumanists, and now of course they're a very disparate set of scholars, they like to trouble the all too familiar premise that people are somehow above nature and not just a different part of it. Added to that has been the faintly formulated intuition that our persistently popular Western ideas of autonomy from nature may have something to do with what increasingly appeared to me in my close work on race historiography as a particular idea of mind. Now, characteristically in Western philosophy and theology, the idea of mind is traced back to the twin premises of reason, um, dating back to the ancients, and the notion of eternal soul from religious texts, notably Genesis. And regardless of whether 
this attribute of mind is taken to be a force for good or whether it's taken to be a force for evil, the entity of human mind itself is often, usually, generally taken to be uncontroversial. It's inscribed as a kind of black box that tends either to just get reified or vilified, including by those feminist and ecological critiques which in turning more to the emotional or bodily or material aspects of culture have tended to avoid mine, leaving it intact as largely unproblematised. And which is not to say uh, necessarily here or imply for a minute a criticism of that work, simply to just note that mind has not been their interest. So mind has come to appear as a metaphysics even, that for better or worse, depending on one's point of view, was handed down from the ancients, elaborated in biblical anthropology, prevailed through Christian enlightenment, informed industrial modernity, justified a mastery of nature and in some arguments also of women, surpassed Darwin's claim for continuity with the apes, landed us on the moon and evinces its both impressive and destructive evidence right into the present. But if we continued to maintain the unexamined premise that we enact our very humanity as people, as we overcome nature, there is a risk, I think, of playing into the hands of the most recent advocates today of the thesis of human exception from nature. For just one of these advocates, Keenan Malik, in a 2001 piece, we people possess, he states, and I quote, a unique and self-evident ability to transform ourselves, our natures, our worlds. This is now confirmed in his words, not by any lingering Christian metaphysics, but by the entire trajectory of civilization itself, from cave art to quantum physics and the conquest of space. For him, the existence of a uniquely human capacity to transcend nature lies in our very natures. Such breathtaking certainty about our human destiny no doubt informs the optimism of some today that there are no limits to the human inventiveness needed to overcome the threat of ecological catastrophe. There's nothing ultimately to worry about. With our technological prowess, we'll sort it, she'll be right, etc., and so on and so forth. And I am married to an engineer, so. <laughs> but with what I like to think of as um, the spirit of provocation, that is, Fagale, I believe a very loud rattle is needed in this fundamentally humanist cage. And it's with this purpose that my own concern has been to take a closer, harder look at how this idea of the human got to endure, and in particular, how confidence in some human mental capacity to transcend nature came to be sustained in today's supposedly secular world. For the next few minutes then, what I'm going to be especially focused on then is the 19th century, when emerged in the science of craniometry a quite specific formulation of mind as intelligence, and later in the century come Darwinism of mind as mental evolution. It's a history that, as we'll shortly see, intersects with that of race and not, and not incidentally, I should say, but constitutively. Now, ordinarily, the relative significance attributed by critical race theorists to craniometry is traced to the idea, fully articulated by phrenologists at the end of the 18th century, that the skull housed the brain as the organ of mind. For history of science critics Stephen Jay Gould and Nancy Stefan, the privilege accorded to the head by 19th century race scientists is not in itself contentious, or for that matter, even really of interest. For Stefan, head measuring was an extension of the earlier Christian focus on skin colour. For Gould, the pernicious practice was symptomatic in his words, and I should add in his very vague words of, and I quote, the importance of mentality in our lives. For him too then, in classic critical race theory terms, craniometry was simply a case of instrumental power 
turning racial difference and race hierarchy into innate states that justified the crimes, and indeed they were, that went on in their name. But to fold the head in this way into some inexhaustible trajectory of European othering is to gloss over the very interesting specificity of the head in the whole fetishised apparatus of human bodies that went on in this period. It's also to gloss over an interesting time period that repays more attention if the analo analytical optic on race is reset to the wider horizon of the human. For this period of the late 18th and 19th centuries is precisely one in which the identification, the identification of the human's exceptional status with a metaphysical defining characteristic was being challenged, was being turned into a problem, it was becoming a debate. Ancient and medieval accounts invoking the great chain of being from angels uh, to insects was more generally coming under pressure from the rise of science, empiricism, biology, and especially anatomy. Scientists after Linnaeus's 18th century classification of people as part of the order of nature were contending that the human could and should be understood as a purely physical rather than metaphysical being. A new science, as it was called, led by comparative anatomists such as George Cuvier, was arguing that the human was one living being among others and thus its features and the newly opened question of its uniqueness ought to be the matter of a purely empirical scientific inquiry. Determining the character of the human in physical terms then became a major scientific project with efforts to assess and compare the anatomies of people and animals, especially apes. But also and arguably above all, to determine the material existence of a distinctly human form of mind, or worded differently, to try to render reason in anatomical terms. This 19th, of 19th century obsession with the head, in which the skulls of the world's people, including so-called mad, degenerate and criminal, and also some female skulls, mostly male skulls were used, as Elizabeth Fee writes in a very interesting piece um, about uh, craniometry in the 19th uh, century. This obsession with um, the world's skull, skulls um, is, as, as mentioned earlier, usually understood and theorised as an instance, as a, a thoroughly pernicious instance of scientific racism. To put things too succinctly, however, the possibility raised here is that craniometry has also to be understood in the context of this concern to establish a new science of the human. For in this context, the head acquired its significance insofar as it concentrated the intense 19th century controversy about whether the human was more than another animal and whether and how this more could be scientifically, which is to say anatomically, demonstrated. So a hypothesis then, trying to condense things as succinctly as possible here. Racial skulls were measured as part of an effort to determine the physical existence of mind. And how was this done in methodological terms? By correlating the already known levels of development of various people, and so the already known extent to which they were presumed to have exercised some distinctly human capacity of mind with variations in the size and shape of their skulls. Giving rise then to comparative forms of presentation. Now, I've always wanted to show one of these tables that people can't even read, not even in the front row, much less at the back row. Um, but my purpose here is actually not that you can read um, the, the, in the text so much as to capture, I suppose, the comparative form of presentation that went on um, here by Samuel Morton in the 1850s, a table showing the size of brain in cubic meters of the races and families of man. And um, incidentally, at the base of this table, we find the Australians, um, and at the peak, we find uh, the modern Caucasian group. <coughs> at the top of it, I should say, not the, the peak. So then, comparative forms of presentation uh, tabulated in uh, 
the, the craniometric information tabulated in this form. And, and what Morton was using was um, to become a very influential index. Um, this was the index of cranial capacity. Um, and uh, Samuel Morton was writing, by the way, in, from the United States um, after the abolition of slavery. Um, what he used and came up with was the index, um, which was calculated, uh, derived, I should say, by calculating the ratio of head width to length. Um, so that was the cranial index. And one can go on, as I um, will in a, in a little while, about some of the other indices that we're using. But I'm trying to get across as succinctly as possible here a kind of speculation that's running here for me in this kind of argument, that the idea of race emerges out of a struggle to establish the physical distinction of humans from animals. And as such, racial discourse itself might be considered not only as an intersubjective dynamic of power or identity politics, which of course it is, but more fundamentally as a discourse on the human, as a discourse in which the very question of the distinctively human was at stake, and as a discourse in which this distinctiveness came to be formulated. This is to invert the usual social science analyses that reduce invocations of the more or less human and also of the more or less intelligent to some ethnocentric will or impulse. It's to trace the impulse itself to a certain problematic of the human and more specifically is to trace it to the anxieties in the 19th century surrounding the cherished idea that the human is exceptional among beings. Anxieties that only intensified in the later 19th century period of evolutionary craniometry, when the science that tried to read off intelligence from head size and head shape grew that much more fraught in the context of efforts to understand the human place in evolution, and especially Darwin's claims for continuity of people with apes. A couple of um, images then from uh, this period, uh, note ag again of an Aboriginal Australian, and I think images that call up what is also a very interesting global specimen exchange economy um, that was happening within this uh, colonial context. Um, not just of skulls, but also here some interior um, uh, cerebral hemisphere diagramming um, of an adult Australian male. It's during this period of the 1890s then, after Darwin's writings, that we find, and especially in the writings of Alfred Wallace, race being again constitutively invoked in evidence for connection to a whole new human-animal problematic of evolution. If we take Thomas Huxley, for example, writing um, in 1897, Man's Place in Nature and Other Anthropological Essays, uh, note here um, uh, the Australian again being used as the very referential limit here of what it meant um, to be human. The Australian then is used um, as this referential limit to claim that it was um, the faculty of mind as located in the skull that was the agent of a distinctively human cultural, uh, human evolutionary development now called culture, no less. And the madness of this frantic but of course always futile search for some accurate correlation between physical features and some score of intelligence becomes clear in the sheer variety of measures, indices, ratios, instruments um, that were um, used and proposed as the 19th century progressed, including the facial goniometer, um, Paul Broker here, his uh, facial angle, uh, the cephalometer, the craniometer, the cranioscope, the cranio four, the craniostat, and so on. Objects, devices that, for me at least, uh, become quite fascinating um, in the very interpenetration they call up of the technological and the human. <coughs> More to the point, I think, few scientific projects were to be as devastating for Australia's Aboriginal people as evolutionary craniometry. 
To be clear, this was a project that drew on stereotypes of Indigenous and other people in order to try and demonstrate the existence of a uniquely human capacity to surpass nature, a capacity which then came to constitute the very measure of what it was to be human. So while many other researchers, especially historians and anthropologists, have already railed convincingly, this is a very congested field, against the stereotype of Stone Age man, taking issue as they have in an appropriate culturally relativistic way with the ethnocentrism of a Western model of civilization that it was, was at stake in these measurements. I'm trying to suggest a different kind of ethical and ontological concern here. Chipping away as I wish to at the peculiar ontology of the human that underpinned the craniometric project. I've been trying to prise open the gate that has been erected around the presumption in this apparently secular moment after Darwin that to be human was, is, to be the life form that becomes itself in transcending nature. I'm going to move now uh, to a conclusion. <coughs> Perhaps all this ferreting about in the, in the past that I've laid out here and with due respect to historians uh, in the audience, perhaps all this digging about in archives in the past and so on might not be so important, but for the fact that such premises leave their legacy right up to the present day. A couple of Fridays ago I was um, in preparing this lecture flipping through the Sydney Morning Herald and came across an editorial by a Lord Richard Rogers on the latest Barangaroo proposal for the western rim of Sydney's uh, central business district. <coughs> now I don't expect people here to be um, especially uh, interested or, or to know a great deal about Sydney's uh, latest urban development controversy. Um, as I'll come to in a moment, this doesn't particularly matter because my point here is more general and evocative, um, which it, it, it only can be at this time. Lord Richard Rogers was the author of the editorial. He, for those of you who don't know, is a British architect, noted for his modernist designs. Here he is. Um, uh, he's designed the Pompidou Centre in Paris and latterly um, the new World Trade Centre in New York City. <coughs> he's the one in the, the grey uh, jacket uh, with his uh, colleagues looking at this um, mock design of the new World Trade Centre. As for the Sydney Morning Herald editorial, its headline announces proudly, Barangaroo to become a visionary portal. And it starts out like this. Cities are the grandest physical expressions of our humanity and are at the very heart of our culture. It goes on, our design for Barangaroo brings the equivalent of a concrete backyard, a wasteland, back to life. Now, I'm not prone to brazen leaps across time as might be uh, conveyed by this leap from Thomas Huxley in the 1890s through to the present day, but I did find myself wondering, pondering while digesting uh, this piece, at the same time as, yes, being able to admire some aspects of the design. But I did find myself pondering along these lines. From where stems the self-congratulatory tone the bold confidence of the likes of Lord Rogers. And yes, I realise that he was making a sales pitch as the preferred architect for this um, proposal. But is, must, the most convincing rhetorical move still be in this, the 21st century, a triumphal narrative that thinks that we have displayed, and I quote, the very heart of our culture in surpassing what is otherwise merely, inertly, blandly, there, as if without us to animate it, matter itself and by its very nature would be without meaning or purpose or coherence, lacking, lifeless, dead. I was moved to ask um, myself by the end of the editorial and inspired, I sh should say, in part by uh, this projection of what Barangaroo might become 
Uh, this is obviously a counter proposal, the worst of Dubai here being projected uh, for this site, uh, published also in the Sydney Morning Herald. And it does give you some uh, idea of the contention around this site. But I was moved to ask, how can there be change in the direction of a more sustainable form of human culture in the present day? Beyond what is the now suspect modern investment in humanity's progressive control over nature, while we invest in such fantasies of nature transcendence, fantasies of precisely the kind I've been trying to trouble this evening. I was reminded too by the editorial of the complacency in the conviction of, of some of today's human exceptionalists that I mentioned earlier. For whom to recall in quoting, our unique ability to trans transform ourselves our natures, our worlds, is now confirmed by the entire trajectory of civilization itself, from cave art to quantum physics and the conquest of space. Perhaps it's this belief too that at some level prompts author Ian McEwan to state in a recent interview in The Guardian, human ingenuity will save us from climate change. There's also an uncanny regurgitation of the terra nullius myth by Lord Rogers of the rescue and re redemption of an apparent wasteland that mutely awaits modern colonial improvement. But if we probe, as I have here tonight, the very premise that mind is the assured marker of a distinction, a human distinction from nature, if accordingly Australia's inhabitants are forced to acknowledge some shared being in common with the natural world, or should I say with the non-human world, are there fresh, fresh prospects for reconciling settler and indigenous values on this continent? I can hope so. What I do think is that in the Australian context, there's been a tendency to freeze the story of colonial racism in the narrative grip of inevitably opposed, antagonistic human identities, settler versus indigenous. Here, by contrast, I've tried to pull out race from the sometimes polarizing and stifling domain of identity politics in which matters of race are usually confined. And I've done this by drawing race instead into a broader ecological concern with the multiplicity of relationships in which human beings are embedded. The suggestion follows that the history of Australian colonialism has been as much bound up with the history of what Bruno Latour calls the incomplete secularisation of the human as it has been with inevitably opposed identities. Thinking through this lens is potentially transformative politically, ethically I think, given that this history of our incomplete secularisation is one that implicates us all. As such, perhaps it's the ground for more genuine intercultural dialogue at a time when all Australians face the collective challenge of negotiating the terms of a new relationship to environment. This is a slide of Faye before she uh, took ill. Faye Gale would, I hope, have been intrigued, uh, if not impressed, uh, by this way of thinking, the shared space of Australia, as she described the surface of this continent in a Cunningham lecture for the Academy in uh, 1998. Her style of geography, taking in both landscape and people, certainly encouraged me to find ways of acknowledging that our entanglements and our responsibilities can't be contained within the conventional conception of a culture that is opposed to nature. Her holistic geography inspired this quest, just as latterly it takes a sense of purpose from a whole range of efforts across the social sciences and humanities to forge new modes of inter and transdisciplinary engagement and inquiry. So I'm going to conclude then on what I hope is now an appropriately uh, personal note. It's hard to measure the benefit that is gained from being exposed, as I was at an early age, 
to a woman who teaches, organises field trips, advises the government, manages staff and bu bu um, budgets, publishes, runs an international conference, supervises graduate students, applies for grants to still do more, and yet whose door remained open to all, or perhaps not all those geomorphologists, <laughs> but, but by and large most of them. It's only as one moves further along one's own academic path that it's possible to grasp just how much Faye was fielding and how much she was directing. Part of the key to her success, I, I think, I, f I, I believe, is found in the exquisitely tuned mix of certain um, personal, professional dispositions that she held throughout her university roles. Not least, a matter-of-fact pragmatism combined in the very best sense with the university mission of a deep respect for ideas and scholarship. <coughs> From a city creek bed on one of Faye Gale's undergraduate excursions about sacred sites, to the lecture theatre, perhaps this was it, at Adelaide University, where I met a role model who seemed to think so productively with more than just her brain. To the Aboriginal mission at Hermansburg on an honours field trip from which I returned with images of blighted lives that I can't ever forget. To the Canberra office of the presidency of the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee where we would meet sometimes while I tried to forget that I worked at a military academy. To the ANU base of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia where I had coffee with a president whose whole ethos seemed to encapsulate the very charter of that academy. To the Paris office of the Australian National Committee for UNESCO that she chaired. To the airport lounge and I'll finish with this, to the, to the airport lounge where she and I worked on the book Inventing Places, note if you will, lingering traces of military attire. <coughs> <laughs> she touched my life as she did so many students who went on to pursue a range of professions. Faye leaves an inestimable legacy that I hope to have captured in at least some of the lines of flight that I've charted out here this evening. I thank and pay tribute to her regardless. Thank you. <laughs>